So let's take a look at domestication. What is domestication? Uh, well, domestication is the production of a new breed or new species of animal or plant uh, through human selection. Right? So rather than natural selection, uh, and rather than nature choosing the most adaptable or the, the best organism to survive, humans are choosing for specific traits of animals and plants and they're choosing traits that are beneficial to humans and over generations of selection they end up producing entirely new breeds or entirely new species in many cases the end result is an animal that can no longer survive on its own or would have great difficulty doing so so for example this is a type of domesticated sheep in Turkey called a fat-tailed sheep. You can see that there's a large fatty tail hanging over uh, the hindquarters over here. Um, and I don't know for sure, but people have told me that these animals cannot reproduce on their own. Uh, the fat tail is blocking the genitalia. So how do they reproduce? Humans have to hold up the tail during mating season so they can actually uh, mate. Not my favorite job in the world, right? But someone's got to do it. Um, and so if you let these animals free in the wild, they wouldn't be able to survive. Uh, There's some dog breeds. Uh, I'm sure you would um, agree that uh, if it took, let's say, a little uh, corgi and you let it free in the woods, uh, it wouldn't survive. You know, many, many dogs now, domesticated dogs, are in a symbiotic relationship with humans. They really can't, I mean, they can, some dogs can uh, live on the street or live in the wild and, and survive, but many dogs are dependent on humans and we've grown dependent on dogs as well. Right? Uh, and how did we produce all of these breeds? Through human selection. Right? Humans choosing which animals will breed, what genes will be passed down, uh, and what genes won't. Uh, and so you select for certain things. Uh, it was this uh, viewing domestication and breeding, Charles Darwin actually seeing and observing the process of breeding that helped him formulate the idea of evolution through natural selection because he saw how it worked with people doing the selection and then you know realized that uh, nature is doing the same thing over long periods of time. So, in terms of many of these animals, uh, what would be characteristics that would be beneficial in natural selection versus human selection? Well, the, it could be very different. So let's take a characteristic like size. Um, would a larger animal be able to survive better in the wild? In general, you would say yes. Now, would humans want a larger animal? Well. You know, you might say yes because there's more meat, but the problem with a larger animal, it's more difficult to control. So we're going to see almost, um, you know, uniformly, people selected for smaller animals. And the end result was a domesticated species that was smaller than the wild species. And humans did this mostly because smaller animals are easier to control. Okay, what about intelligence? Would intelligence be an advantage in the wild? Of course. Well, what about for people? Uh, would you want a very smart animal? Um, in general, no. Uh, you don't want it so unintelligent that it's having a hard time to survive. But again, less intelligent animals are easier to control. So human beings in general selected for animals that were less intelligent. Aggressiveness, the same thing. Aggression would be a benefit in the wild, but it's something that human beings would not want, and they would select for more docile creatures. So, for example, when you think of sheep, you know, you think of the, uh, the bighorn sheep, uh, very aggressive, they're big, and they're pretty smart. Uh, domesticated sheep are just the opposite. They're docile, and unfortunately for them, they're not too intelligent. Um, so I remember reading this article when I was in Turkey once. Uh, a shepherd had a flock of sheep. Some of the sheep started to fall off the edge of a cliff. The other sheep followed and ended up with 450 sheep 
uh, falling off a cliff. Um, weren't smart enough to, to stop themselves. Uh, how do you prevent something like this from happening? Well, you always mix goats in with your sheep. Goats, uh, for some reason, we have not dumbed down too much. Uh, maybe we just couldn't. Uh, and so goats usually prevent sheep from doing things like this. Okay, what about plants? What are some of the changes that occurred in plants like wheat and barley? Well, here you have a picture of two forms of barley. One's domesticated and one is wild. If you had to take a guess which one is the domesticated variety of barley, what would you say? Well, if you guessed the left side is the domesticated barley, you're exactly right. Um, human beings selected for a plant that produced larger seeds, uh, providing more food. Uh, human beings also selected for uh, something, a, a certain um, attribute of what's called a rachis. The attachment of the seed to the stalk is called a rachis. Now, would you want a brittle rachis or would you want a tough rachis? With a tough rachis, the seeds stay pretty firmly to the stalk. With a brittle rachis, the seeds fall off easily. Uh, you might say, well, the easier they come off, the easier it is to process the food. But remember, uh, this is actually a benefit in nature where wind blows through a barley strand or a wheat field and disperses the seeds. If you're harvesting the barley or the wheat, uh, some of these seeds may fall to the ground as you're harvesting them. And you don't really want that to happen. So human beings selected for plants that had a tougher rachis so that the seeds would stay firmly to the stalk. They could take those stalks back to the village and process them. Um, also, human beings learn to uh, cultivate these plants outside of where they naturally occurred. Uh, and we're going to see that in Mesopotamia. Now, you know, processing wheat and barley into bread is pretty labor intensive. You have to harvest the wheat, then you have to do what's known as threshing. Threshing separates the seeds from the stalk. At the end of that, you have a big pile of chaff, and then you uh, mix them with wheat kernels. And you have to separate them, separate the wheat from the chaff. You would, what you would do is you would do something known as winnowing. You would use some sort of rake or basket or thing like that, um, and you would throw up the wheat and the chaff in the air, and the wind would blow the chaff away and leave the seeds. Then you would just take those seeds, you would pound the seeds with a soft wooden mortar and pestle that would remove the hull from the outside of the seed. Then you would take that and you would grind it on the grinding stone in order to produce flour. Then you would use that flour to produce bread or you might use some of the uh, hulled barley to make beer. So all of this is very labor intensive as we're going to see with Abu Herrera uh, next week. Um, and so, just like we talked about with compared to hunting and gathering, agriculture is much more labor intensive than hunting and gathering. So, uh, the benefits of agriculture were, you know, there were obviously some benefits, major benefits to agriculture, but there were obviously some major drawbacks. The diet decreased in qual quality for people, and the labor cost increased as well. So uh, it wasn't just a win-win. Okay, so here you can see some of the uh, rachis and the seeds on the stalk. And not only did people select for large two-road barley, but they actually produced a variety called six-road barley. Six rows of seeds on one plant, producing a lot more food. So in terms of the cereal grains, we have barley and then we had two varieties of wheat, einkorn wheat and emer wheat. Um, and barley tends to be more heat resistant and salt resistant. So um, sometimes you can tell if, let's say, the area around the site is getting worse by the amount of barley per wheat that the people were growing at that time. If they start growing more barley... Uh, it might indicate that either it's getting hotter or there's more salt in the soil. So barley is a much hardier crop than wheat. And then we had the legumes. We have you know things like chickpeas, lentils, 
peas and another similar uh, uh, seed called vetch. Now these uh, different domesticates complement each other nutritionally. So you can imagine in ancient times if they were eating their bread and also their crushed chickpeas, something like hummus, um, the, the wheat of the bread has some amino acids but it doesn't have lysine. But chickpeas do have lysine. So by eating it together, you're actually getting a nutritional complement. And also these different plants are adapted to different uh, zones, right? So as we'll see in southern Mesopotamia, because it is so hot there and because of irrigation, there was more and more salt in the soil, they tended to produce more uh, barley. Okay, Jack Harlan uh, doing experiments in uh, Turkey. What he found is he, he went to wild wheat fields in Turkey. And what he found that uh, is that Natufians, when there were strands of abundant wild wheat, that, that this was a, actually a very, uh, you know, livable lifestyle, that the... Um, there was enough food there that it could support a small village. So he was trying to put some of these ideas to the test. Um, okay, so as people domesticate these plants and then these animals, they move the plants to other areas where they didn't necessarily grow in the wild. They removed pressures of natural selection. That, that is, they provided the water. They replanted the seeds uh, rather than having it you know, be dispersed by the wind and planting naturally. And they selected for characteristics which were not beneficial under natural selection. Tough rachises are not beneficial because you want those seeds to disperse in the wind so that the seeds will spread to other areas. Okay, now let's look at animal domestication. We have two bones over here. This is the same kind of animal. Um, and you can see that this portion of the bone is equal to this segment of this bone. Um, so you can see that this is a much larger individual. Um, now you might say, well, maybe this is an adult and this is a juvenile or sub-adult. They're both adults. And the way you can tell that is because of the fusion. Right? That is the epiphyses or the ends of the bones have fused together. If it was a juvenile animal, this is what it would look like. The end of the bone would not be fused. So here is a juvenile and here is an adult. So you can actually tell an adult from uh, a juvenile. And in this case, these are both adults. This is a much smaller animal than this. These are both cattle. This is wild cattle. This is domesticated cattle. Human beings selected for much smaller animals. Uh, and you can see a dramatic decrease in size, especially in cattle. You see less of a decrease with some of the other animals. Um, and again, it was because these animals are easier to control. Here are two pig bones. This is wild pig. This is domesticated pig. Again, I can see that it's not as dramatic a decrease in size, but it still is a decrease. Now, if you saw this size reduction in archaeological context, with the bones that you've excavated from a site, you would be able to say that at that point they have domesticated animals. Okay, which animals were domesticated and why? There are definitely animals that were not domesticated through time. We can think of some of them. Um, and this relates a little bit to uh, a popular TV show that uh, was on about a year ago. You might have seen it, Tiger King. Um, and if you saw it, you saw how hard it was to raise tigers. You probably realize that it's nearly impossible to domesticate them. But you saw some of the challenges. Right? He had all these tigers um, and he was going broke trying to feed them. Uh, if you have carnivores, they have to eat. Um, you know, dogs can scavenge, so they're you know, medium size. Cats can you know, eat mice and other things. If you've got something like a tiger, it eats a lot, uh, and so you have to provide food for it. Uh, and that could be extremely difficult. 
So carnivores are not typically good animals to domesticate. Herbivores are excellent because they'll just go out and eat the grass. They'll eat stuff that you won't eat, so they're not even competing with you. Um, they're, they're producing meat and they're producing wool and milk and other things, and they're not even competing with you for food. Um, so herbivores are great for domestication. What kinds of herbivores? Well, herbivores that tend to want to be in groups, herd, herd herbivores. Um, they'll naturally want to be in large groups. They kind of have a social hierarchy. It makes them easier to domesticate. So the worst animals to domesticate are solitary animals or, and or carnivores. Best animals to domesticate, herd animals that are herbivorous. Uh, and the first domesticates in the Middle East were sheep, goat, cattle, and pig. Um, th th these animals exist in that area in the wild. They were the first animals that were domesticated. Uh, gazelle and deer, the, uh, the animals that were hunted by the Natufians, were not domesticated. They were not as suitable for domestication. Okay, there are other changes that occur in the animals. Some of these are not visible archaeologically, though, right? So you can't see when the changes to the wool, woolly coat occurs. But over time, people selected for sheep that produce more of the woolly fibers and less of the long fibers that cover the woolly fibers. Uh, you can see a little bit of this in later artwork, but there are no depictions of it uh, archaeologically from the Natufian or the Neolithic. Uh, and obviously it's not going to preserve archaeologically. You're only getting animal bones, so you can't really tell uh, this. You also can't tell uh, aggressiveness or intelligence from bones. Uh, really, what you're getting is size as an indicator. Um, so here's wild cattle in Europe called the aurochs. Here's the first domesticated cattle in Europe. And you can see dramatic size reduction. So if you look, for example, at one kind of bone uh, in the Middle East, and you look at it over time, thousands of years ago, the measurement of this bone, you can see that it's pretty much stayed the same until you get to about 8,000 uh, years ago, right, uh, 9,000 years ago, so around 8,000 BC, uh, we see a dramatic decrease in the size of that bone, showing that this is the period um, where we have domesticated animals. Okay, so let's look at a couple just really briefly. So again, this is cattle, wild, domesticated. Pig, uh, domesticated and wild. And capra, which like Capricorn, goat, wild goat, domesticated goat. All right, let's look at a couple of other indicators of domestication. Horn shape changes in goats. So in wild goats in the Middle East, you have, uh, well, goats have these long scimitar shaped horns. In domesticated goats, they have shorter helically twisted corkscrew shaped horns. They're much shorter. Uh, so horns like these would be a benefit to an animal in the wild, would be a benefit to sheep for defense against predators and also for mating. Um, with humans scaring off predators, there's really no need to have those large horns and they might actually be a hindrance because you have to use energy to um, upkeep those horns. And so we see a decrease in size, but also they become twisted. Now, you don't always get the actual horn, the outer keratin uh, layer around it, but what you usually get archaeologically is the bone beneath the horn, what's known as the horn core that's attached to the skull there. So in, this is a sample from Turkey, from a site I'm going to mention it again in a minute, called Gritula. At the site of Gritula in Turkey, they, you can see they have only a portion of the horn core from the animal, but that you can see that twist. And that's a good indication that these goats were domesticated at this time period. Okay, another indication of domestication, either that they're beginning to domesticate the animals, control them, or that they have been domesticated, is something called culling. Culling is selective killing off of animals in a herd. Uh, and so one of the readings mentions that 
finding an archaeological site with young animals that are killed off or, or the presence of animal bones of very young animals is a good indication of human control and culling. Because if you control the herd, you can kill off animals at any age range that you want. So imagine you have a herd of sheep, and imagine that you're using them mainly for meat. What would be the age of the animal at which you would start killing them off? You wouldn't want to kill them off at three months old because they're not very large yet. And you wouldn't want to kill them off at 10 years old because the meat would not be good quality when in such an old animal. What you would do, and this graph is showing the culling pattern, right? Here's the number of animals that would be killed off at certain ages. And this is the kind of die-off or uh, survivorship curve, the decrease from 100% to 0% of that population of sheep, right? So around a little past one years of age, the animal would be full grown, full size, good quality meat, they would kill off some of those animals for meat, and then they would keep, uh, you know, 25, 30% around to uh, propagate again and replace uh, the herd next season. So this is what it would look like if you grafted, if you collected all of the animal bones of a certain species, figure out what, uh, how old they were when they died, plot it out, you could tell what ancient people were actually using those animals for. Okay, what about milk? Well, you know, obviously the females are the most important. They're producing the milk. Now, what animals are competing with you for milk? The very young animals. Now, of the young animals, which are the least useful? The young males. You only need a few males to keep the herd going. Uh, you would keep the young females to grow up and eventually produce milk. So if they were maximizing milk production, what you would see is a very sharp drop, even before one year of age, uh, a kill-off of very, very young animals, and then a very slow, gradual decline as they use the rest of those animals for milk. Now, what about wool? If you're using them for wool, there's no reason to kill them off at any period, and you just have a very gradual decline. Uh, and so this is what it would look like, all three of the culling patterns, one on top of the other. Here in the red is milk, in the blue is meat, and in the green is wool. So they worked at a site called Gritilla in Turkey. It's a very early Neolithic site. They wanted to see uh, in the beginnings of animal domestication what were the animals mainly used for? What could have been the main incentive to domesticate animals? So the first thing they had to do was to figure out the age of the animals. Uh, how do you do that? Well, you could use several different methods. The fusion method allows you to tell the difference between juveniles and adults. Right? And you can also do this with teeth. Um, some of you guys are probably getting your wisdom teeth in, uh, or they're beginning to erupt. Some of you might be needing to schedule surgery to have them removed, like I, I did when I was in college. Um, you can see here, this is a very young sheep or goat. You can see sheep and goat have these high, uh, sharp cusps on the molars to grind grass and things like that. All the molars have erupted here, not here. This is obviously a juvenile. This is an adult. Here are some pig mandibles or lower jaws. And you can see that all the teeth have erupted here, but you look here and you can see that those molars have not erupted yet. These are juveniles, subadults, haven't reached adulthood. Now, what happens though when you have adult sheep, they have all their teeth. Could you tell the difference between a two-year-old sheep and a 10-year-old sheep? They all have the same numbers of teeth. But the wear patterns would be different. In a 10-year-old sheep, the molars would be worn down more. Um, and so you could use that to figure out from jaw bones how old those animals were. Well, how, how, what do the teeth of an 8-year-old sheep look like? How can you tell this? Luckily for us, someone has already done this work. Uh, Zooarchaeologists went around Turkey to shepherds and ask them the age of their sheep and then use this little vice to open up the mouth and drew pictures of the molars. Uh, 
uh, and created a handy chart where you can see here very very young crisp molars to worn down molars uh, has sort of the ages for each of these wear patterns and so if you use your archaeological sample and you compare it against this chart you can figure out how old your animal was when it died. Okay, so here is the survivorship curve from Gritilla. Here you can see one year, two year. Now, in general, do you think people were mainly using the animals for milk, for meat, or for wool? Well, if you guess meat, you're exactly right. Uh, if, this, if they were using them mainly for milk, you'd see a sharp drop here, even before one years of age. But you see the drop off occurring around one, two years when they're full adults. Uh, and so it shows that they were maximizing the herd for meat production. And that probably was the main incentive to domesticate sheep, goat, cattle, and pig, the earliest domesticates, have a ready supply of meat on hand. And again, that is around 7,000 BC. Only later, thousands of years later, around 3,000 BC, is when you get a secondary animal domestication of transportation animals, donkeys, horses, and camels. So that comes later. The earliest domesticated animals, though, were meat animals, then later used for milk and also for uh, maximized for wool. So they were probably using those animals for wool as well, and probably also for meat, meat uh, milk, but they're maximizing the use for meat. Okay, can we see the lead up to domestication in the Natufian? Uh, yes, we can. Um, look, we talked about the, the lead up uh, and the beginning of cultivation of plants, but also during the Neolithic, we start to see a uh, experimentation with animals. And what you see is that there's a shift in the kinds of animals that are found at archaeological sites, right? So, for example, you know, this would be the, the blue would be the PPNA, right? Uh, early part of the PPNA and then shifting to the PPNB. What you see is in the earlier period, they're using more gazelle and deer and fox than they are pig and cattle and sheep and goat. But then they start to switch over to the animals that become the domesticated animals. Right, sheep and goat, cattle and pig. They're still eating gazelle and some of these other things, but they're eating these other animals in much higher numbers. That's another good indication that either domestication is occurring or has occurred. Another good piece of evidence, plants or animals, as we said before, in areas where they don't live naturally. People had to bring them there uh, and have to provide them with uh, the ability to survive in that environment. There's sometimes cultural evidence of domestication. Sometimes you get depictions of uh, animals and artwork that show them in the you know being used as plow animals or being milked or things like that. Sometimes you get that um, in the Neolithic and the Near East. You get a little bit of that, but as we're going to see, not that much. Uh, or burial of animals with humans might also indicate the process of domestication or the beginnings of domestication. All right. Okay, so what are some of the indicators of domestication? Well, in plants, in wheat and barley, you would say larger seeds, a tough rachis, right? uh, and existing in areas outside of where they naturally uh, live. That would indicate to you a domesticated plant. What about animals? Smaller size, uh, twisted horns and goats, culling patterns that show human use, maybe um, artistic depictions occurring outside of the natural range, and shifting patterns from uh, certain animals to animals that eventually become domesticated. These would all be good pieces of archaeological evidence that people had domesticated the animals by a certain time or were in the process of domesticating those animals. Okay, uh, this will be the end for week two. Uh, next week what we're going to be looking at is a, a number of Neolithic sites in the Middle East like Jericho, uh, Ein Gazal, Chatohuyuk, uh, 
right? Um, at the end of this week, you're going to be doing a little discussion board post on the site called Gobekli Tepe. I'm going to be putting some short readings online, and you're just going to be answering a few questions and also trying to uh, discuss, react to what other students uh, say about uh, the reading.